Good morning. This is the uh, Ventricular Assist Device uh, Roundtable here at the SDS uh, meeting in Los Angeles, California, 2013. Uh, we'll be uh, speaking about uh, relevant issues in uh, mechanical support. Uh, I think we're going to tackle a couple of issues with uh, Ventricular Assist Device that are particularly uh, interesting and in, uh, uh, causing us to scratch our heads a lot. Uh, the participants to this meeting will be... I'm Nader Mozami, staff surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic. Chris Suorno, cardiac surgeon, St. Vincent Heart Center of Indiana. Uh, I'm Ewan Wong, a staff surgeon at IU Methodist Hospital in Indianapolis. Um, I want to start with Dr. Mozami. Uh, on Nader, as you know, we've had quite great success with the current uh, available approved ventricular assist devices, particularly the HeartMate uh, 2 device. We have patients that are leaving now two and three years. We're starting to see these people coming back into the hospital with, for readmissions and different complications. What's your take on it? What are you seeing uh, about your patients coming back to the hospital? Yeah, I mean, uh, as you know, Danny, that there's been tremendous uh, uh, improvement in these devices over the last decade. And as a result of this, we've seen a dramatic increase in the number of patients getting uh, these devices, particularly the HeartMate 2. Uh, as of January, actually, there's been about 13,000 implants um, worldwide with this device. So we now have a lot of uh, clinical experience uh, particularly within the short term with these devices. Um, I am worried, however, uh, about what the long-term uh, outcome of these patients is going to be as we start seeing patients being on these devices three years, four years, five years. I really don't think that we have enough experience uh, in terms of some of the complications that may occur with these patients uh, because the physiology is quite different with these pumps. So what's particularly bothering you? What, what are you seeing coming back to the, into the hospital or seeing in the clinic recurrently that bothers you? Uh, well, I think uh, at top of the list is infections. Um, I think that the longer the patients go on with these devices, it's almost inevitable that infections will set in. Uh, and once uh, these uh, infections uh, get started, it's very difficult to control these patients. Well, what infection are you talking about here? Well, I think the vast majority of these are driveline infections uh, in particular. Uh, and again, as you know, once that interface uh, is uh, broken, it becomes very difficult to manage these patients. Uh, they will have a chronic ongoing infection. And I believe that you have shown on your data uh, that at least there is a suggestion that patients with infections have a higher mortality over the long term. Mm -hmm. Chris, well, what do you think about infection? I mean, have you noticed the difference? There's a lot of talk, I mean, both of you to weigh in here, but uh, there's a lot of talk that if you bury the velour surface of the Army 2 driveline, you'll see less infections. Have you seen that? Is that what you're doing? We've been burying the entire velour for probably two years now, but I, I agree with Nader. I think if you stay in support long enough, inevitably you're probably going to have an infection. The question is when. Um, it, we see patients now who present with driveline infections with the buried volor maybe three years out instead of at uh, six months out. There are ways to manage them. The hope is that, uh, that it doesn't ascend to become a pump pocket infection. One of the problems is there's not a good surgical way to treat it if you have an advanced driveline infection. People have used wound vax, uh, pump exchange, but nothing is definitive. If the devices get to the point that the driveline is either absent or modular, we'll have a much better way to treat these patients. I think we have to be very careful about using transplantation as a bailout strategy for destination therapy patients who get device infections. And I know this has been talked about, but this is probably not the patient population we want to start transplanting. And I agree. I mean, I think there is really no good surgical answer to what really is a surgical problem. And, uh, but I think, you know, once we get to the point where the devices are, <clears throat> are able to work with an internal source of power without having a transcutaneous power line. I think that would be a huge step. But I think also along the way, though, as the devices improve, we have to, I think, remind the device companies and the manufacturers that um, the cost of these devices are becoming to be a really important issue. I mean, our reimbursement for these procedures are finite, and the fixed cost of the device is an important part of it. So if you bill me a perfect bad with no drive line, internalized power source, no risk of infection, you know, thrombotic resistance, et cetera, et cetera, but cost $250,000. There's not going to be a way that we, anybody will put in those devices. So there has to be almost a, not just a paradigm shift in how we select patients for it, but, you know, for these devices, but the companies have to change the, their thinking. I mean, it almost needs to look at how we can make these devices Manu more manufacturable, more reproducible. We have to go away from hand-building 
all these thousands of devices into something that can be automated, manufactured in a process. So, you know, it's like the Model T4, right? You know, we, we all would love to drive a Bentley, but the hand, Bentley's hand-built, and we can't afford a $200,000 car. But I can go drive a Ford Fusion for or twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, the sell. problem. Sure, the problem there is the companies will be happy to have to make a hundred thousand right. devices for you. Uh, but, <laughs> but that's no not the reality right, right now. And we're uh, not gonna write. I think so, one of the other problems with infections is, before we sort of switch gears, is that we know that people who are infected are at higher risk of other complications, whether they be absolutely. thromboembolic, difficulty controlling the INR because uh, uh, interaction with uh, antibiotics, uh, antibiotics. No. and the patients are. Once they have a severe infection, the clock is ticking. And uh, if they are not a candidate for transplant, currently there's not a great option for those people. Absolutely, big problem. Yeah, I mean, the problem with this is, I'm sure you see it all at your centers, it's recurrent admissions for the same problem. And the patients are discharged uh, home or to a nursing facility, and then they have recurrent uh, bacteremia, even on antibiotics. and. Uh, we actually have some data showing that these infections over time not only become resistance, resistant, but also change. Uh, so, for example, in our center, pseudomonas infections are very prevalent over the long term. Yeah. Does, does anybody know, is there any data about the post-transplant survival in a patient who's bridged the transplant and infected? There was some data published, and I don't recall it off the top of my head, but my recollection is there's really no big difference, difference. in terms of yeah. one-year survival after transplantation, whether you're infected or not. Yeah. Not septic, bacteremic, but uh, right. you know, chronically infected driveline. The uh, Columbia Group just recently actually came out with a paper uh, that they looked back at a decade experience uh, with LVADs as bridge to transplantation. Uh, the primary goal of that paper really was to look to see how organ allocation has changed because of LVADs, because we, as you all know, LVADs are now uh, used more and more often as a gateway to transplantation because of the unostratification. Uh, so that was their goal, but interestingly, uh, about, I think, 30% of their patients um, were transplanted uh, and required a 1A exemption because of device complications, most of which was infection-related. Uh, so their post-transplant survival in that cohort actually was very good. So the suggestion is that I think that if you do get an infection, your best bailout strategy is transplantation, which we can't necessarily apply to the DT population. Well, that's a controversial topic if we wanted to go down that route because uh, people are upgrading the status of their patients to 1A when they culture the skin and they grow an organism, you know, the patients no white or no fever, they'll just call it drive out infection and use it as a way of upgrading, keeping someone's status 1A, E forever. So that's a, that's a problem. Yeah, so I think the, that's going to so be the current, Right. So the current stratification really does not differentiate what a device complication yeah. is, per se. Yeah. Any infection or anything that, they, uh, that we think is an infection is, is eligible. But as you said, uh, I think that there are certain gradations in that. Yeah, and I think that's going to be changing. Joe Rogers is involved in the Eunice Thoracic right. Committee and, and changing those, so we're going to see some changes soon. I think the thing that bothers me the most, and I'm seeing most recurrent, is GI bleeding. Yeah. And most often, the occult type, where they get an upper endoscopy and you don't see anything, and they get a lower endoscopy and you don't see anything, and they keep dropping their hematocrits. You hold the Coumadin, you hold the aspirin, you drop a capsule, and get a, three, four days later, you might get a, a results and find something, you don't find something, eventually it stops. You how do you restart the agents? And are you guys seeing, uh, are you guys seeing this in your hospitals? Without question. Uh, we have, I can think of one patient right now who's had three admissions in the last six months with a hemoglobin of six, and we've never identified the source. He's not hemolyzing. Yeah. And then when we restart his anticoagulation, he comes back in. Uh, I think, again, similar to the infection patient, that type of patient probably is best served by transplantation and removing the device. Um, the data would suggest as many as 30 of these patients with a heart made 2 device can have a, a cold GI bleed, uh, and it's a balance between over anticoagulation and, and thrombosis. Um, I think if there's a strategy and a patient has a known tendency to bleed preoperatively, this may not be the preferred therapy. Um, th there isn't a. Are good... you telling me we should return to pulsatile devices? I think some possibility <laughs> would be helpful. Quite honestly. Well, so so there is might be a possibility that outside of transplantation that we, we should talk about. You know, even you have something to say about <clears> this about reducing speeds and allowing the aortic valve to open. Do you think there's any truth to that? I think there's probably some some validity to that, and I think for a select set of patients. I, I have a hard time believing that um, this entire um, shearing of the 
my molecular von Willebrand's factor can explain yeah. all the GI bleeding cases we've seen. And I agree with Chris. I mean, if you look at different institutions, it's anywhere from 17, 18 percent to as high as 30 percent. And it, but it's but it's pump specific, right? So the different the centrifugal pumps may have a less smaller GI bleeding rate than the actual flow devices. But you know, like for example, certainly in, in, in our in our experience, in my experience when I was WashU, we actually didn't find that to be the case. So again, there's probably some subtle management differences between institutions. And you know, it, honestly, if you truly believe that the von Willebrand's issue is part of it, then should we not do something to address it? Do we sure. not be giving patient DDABP to promote release of von Willebrand's factor? So do we try prophylactically giving him a dose once a week, see if we get the von Willebrand's factor up and that minimize the risk of bleeding? I don't know, no one's, I mean. Well, we know for sure, one of the things that are clear is 100% of these people develop AWVD, right? Acquired right. Willebrand disease. 100% are not bleeding. Right. So there's clearly something else no, besides that in the issue how much uh, additional uh, uh, fault should be uh, construed, uh, be assumed to be the, the only valve not opening. No matter what do you do? Do you, do well, you turn down the speeds on these people? Well, um, you know, I, I think when you first started this, you, you asked, you know, where are we going as a field and what are the issues that we potentially, I think, need to see and address. And I think GI bleeding is a huge problem. I don't think that there's any institution that doesn't deal with this on a, a daily basis or a weekly basis where patients come in with low hematocrits and um, as Chris was suggesting, you know, they undergo a multi-million dollar workup and, and we generally do not find a source or if we find a, find a source, it doesn't uh, take the problem away. So I think, you know, the primary problem that we have failed to address at this point is, you know, why is it that these patients are more prone to GI bleed? I think Initially, there was a lot of enthusiasm about this von Willebrand's deficiency, but uh, the, the field in general, uh, you know, uh, I think is leaning towards the idea that, yes, it contributes, but it's not the entire story. Uh, so many, uh, many teams have tried to alter um, uh, the speed of the pump and manage the patients better uh, to see if that is going to do anything. Uh, so as you suggested, running the pump at a lower speed to allow aortic valve opening periodically. Um, I don't Very quickly, four of us, raise your hand if you do that. So we're all doing it right. to some extent. How comfortable, right. how low is uh, not well, I think, low enough? Right. Now you're getting echoes daily to confirm right. that the aortic valve is open. So opening. I think that that is the problem. The yeah. problem, I think, is that because we don't know the ideology of the GI bleeding where we think that by giving uh, the patient more pulsatility that this will take the problem away, which to my knowledge has never been proved, uh, is, is not the way to approach it. My reason for allowing the aortic valve opening is actually related to something else and not GI bleed. It's but related the aortic to aortic valve fusion and uh, initiation and progression of aortic insufficiencies patients. Uh, so honestly, I don't think I have a solution for GI bleeding, but I think that it behooves us as a community to try to address the etiology of GI bleeding, and then we can fix the problem. I think one thing we should at least talk about is that there appears to be an association between decreased pump speed and the subsequent need for pump exchange. So in a, in a Thoratec database recent review, uh, pump speeds lower than 8400 seem to have a higher incidence of requiring pump exchange. And why is the etiology of that? It's unclear. It may have to do with the internal thrombosis. Change? I do think it has to do with pump thrombus. Yeah. Right. But do they change the anticoagulation? No, for example, not necessarily. You, right. So when you, for example, are right. testing patients for recovery, right. you increase the iron Correct. when you run it. But Correct. I think the question is when we run a slower speed, is there some threshold that we should be changing there? The problem is if you're decreasing the pump speed for GI bleeding, bleeding you can increase stuck. your anticoagulation. You're stuck. Right. You know, I think... Uh, we're all sort of, we talk about the limitations, you know, basically technologies should help all this, right? So if we have more biocompatible surfaces, we'll need less anticoagulation, maybe we'll have some more pulsatility. Just pulsatility. And, and, and it, you know, begs the question of what's the next big paradigm shift, you know, when is the next device going to become available that's going to reset the field the way the HeartMate 2 did when the, you know, uh, when it came out? Well, I, I really think that, that this really sets the form for where do we go from here? And I think that, you know, what the HeartMate 2 and other continuous flow devices did for us over the last decade is that they proved that the concept that this physiology is works in patients and survivals are good and end organ recovery occurs. Uh, but nevertheless, now we're seeing other issues, uh, which I think that if we had pumps that were smarter, uh, that these could address. So pumps that can actually 
measure flow that could have algorithms, speed algorithms that would allow aortic valve opening intermittently, allow more positivity built in the pump itself, maybe these incremental improvements will, ch will change the paradigm uh, as a next step. Yun, so you have all the money in the world and you're going to design the next smart pump. What, what characteristics would you want in this pump? I think, you know, reliability still has to remain. Reliability, durability. Mm -hmm. I think ease of implantation, mm -hmm. ease of explantation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what Chris had already mentioned, modularity of the components. Or no module components, but all no, internal. All internal. I, yeah. I think, I think you know, the one thing I have a real hard time with is that this whole transcutaneous power source, I think, is kind of an intermediate step. Because I think, you know, if you have a patient who is a, a BTT patient, then having to explant all the power coil in it, along with the van and so forth is going to be somewhat cumbersome, yeah. to say the least. I think, you know, it's sort of like the pacemakers, right? When the pacemakers went to an all internal power source so it last five, seven years, whatever, on a battery that's inside, I mean, the market really took off. And for us, I think it's the same thing. We're waiting for what I call the improvement in a collateral technology, that is the efficiency of the motors and efficiency of the power source to get to a point where I think we can run a device for five years on a battery, all internal, and then we can change out the batteries just like we change out batteries for pacemakers. Yeah. And then I think then that would then I think put us to the par next paradigm shift, which is that that is the answer for end-stage heart failure and transplant is the exception and not the rule as the golden, you know, the gold standard for the treatment. So you want a pump that's totally implantable, that is reliable, that is biocompatible, that has pulsatility, may have measure LV pressure, would be nice, that measures flow on a continuous basis, much like the micromed devices, perhaps, you know, flow, ultrasound. Flow um, it's going to last five years. I think it has to be Lar for, has to be large for clearances. So large that, clearances, yeah. big gaps. Big, big gaps, so, so less sheer stress. Yeah. Right. It has to be forgettable. <clears throat> forgettable. Yeah. I think it's a patient you not know it's there, much like these makers and ICDs. If it's possible to be able to use it on both the right and the left side, that would be fantastic. That's, a great, that's a great point. And one of the, the toughest patients we deal with are the ones who have a well-functioning LVAD and come back with RV failure three years later. Yeah. Because we don't have a good solution for those patients yeah. at all. So are we failure late? The other thing that's been described in the literature, though I haven't seen, is renal dysfunction, following recovery. So people go into the ORs, or creatinine is two, two and a half. Three months later, the creatinine is 0.9, and everybody's happy, and then a year, year and a half to later, the creatinine starts climbing up with normal LV functioning, LV functioning. And that's another thing we, we haven't really spoken yeah, about. And again, the these are, insufficiency issues. These are all matters of these long-term issues that yeah. I think that we're going to start seeing more yeah. as we have patients on longer-term support, yeah. uh, things that we perhaps didn't anticipate uh, at the time. Uh, I've also heard uh, this fact that some of these patients, uh, they have increasing uh, grand uh, clearances. Grand cl uh, worsening mm -hmm. grand clearances, yeah. Yeah. even though initially they responded well. Yeah. Uh, and I think, again, as, the, as time goes by, we'll see that. Another issue, of course, is aortic insufficiency, uh, which uh, there are now several reports out suggesting that it develops and progresses in patients, although moderate to severe AI is rare, but still uh, it, it does exist. And how do we address all these issues? Have any of you explanted for AI on having to reoperate on a patient because of aortic insufficiency? I have. I did one for hardware. Mm -hmm. and, um, it was, uh, and it was actually, I w and the, the interesting thing about the AI sometimes, the AI is often eccentric. So on certain views, it doesn't look that impressive. Mm -hmm. And you really have to scan it through every view very carefully mm -hmm. to see it. Because I originally I thought there was something wrong with the pump when the, when the LV wasn't being effectively drained despite yeah. um, changing the yeah. RPMs and so forth. But it, the, the operations, I think, was difficult because, you know, unfortunately, by the time, you know, you decide to take a patient back, the AI is severe. The RV usually struggling, their end organs are not working. You know, my patient was on CVVH, and you know, and the hepatic function is not working. So it's really quite. A, what did you do? So I end up I um, I closed the aortic valve. That was the sort of simplest yeah. operation. I did. You know, I'm very intrigued by these small reports of TAVI for bad way today. I and unfortunately we didn't have the right. access to that. Uh, uh, well, they won't let you do it in the United States, and it's been described in Europe because you know you in need Toronto. That. Uh, Non-US, right. uh, because you need that calcific ridge to really right. see the uh, 
Not an old right. stent in there, and it just. But uh, I think that, that, that's sort of this is what I guess the collateral technology will get better because then yeah. Boling described his uh, direct flow aortic valve that has certain like um, basically a soft conforming mm -hmm. rim mm -hmm. that can be used for AI. Mm -hmm. And I think so. There's a lot of I think intriguing concept that's coming up in which I mean because we we you know I was talking to one of our surgeons exactly about that. Is, you know what are the likelihood of us being able to use TAVI or even just do that for our <clears throat> When we put a, when we have AI, and at the time of putting the VAT in, just to basically do a transapical approach and put the, and again, I think a lot of concern is just that our devices now are primarily for a, um, calcific AS, and not having that, the rigid, um, annulus for you to fix the. Well, the other problem is even if you replace a valve, there's plenty of description now of biological right. prosthesis deteriorating, exactly. and them themselves exactly. having AI, so there's really. A, no, like GI bleeding is a problem with no answers. You know, I've actually been happy with uh, uh, our small series of patients where we've uh, actually cut the valve out or sewn the valve shut, rather than uh, use a park stitch, actually remove the valve and close the whole entire left and trigger output track. Just you put a patch? Patch. Uh, one of the core yeah. matrix? Uh, or uh, actually, we use uh, usually Teflon or a piece of the alpha graph from the... Uh, Why do you cut the valve out? Um, just the, easier to get the These are patients the who had prosthetic valves, oh, and okay. we so we removed the prosthetic valve and put it back. Well functioning prosthetic valve. No, not poor, not non normally function, but in, I haven't seen a problem. In fact, I think the pumps work very well in situations where there is no uh, native flow through the uh, left ventricular mm -hmm. check. Obviously, if the pump were to stop, you have a problem. Yeah. But um, uh, well, the patient does. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but it, it works quite well. Works quite well. So. Clearly, there's issues that we're discovering as we move long term, and that might affect the viability of the field. The other issue is moving towards the lesser sick people. We all know there's, depending on the numbers you look at, somewhere between 70 and 150,000 people who advance heart failure are class four. The currently meet indications, a huge portion of those are over the ages 70, 75. They're, so we're talking closer to 70 to 100,000 people. There's probably a million people, so an order of magnitude greater of people who are advanced class three or class three who could potentially benefit from this therapy who are on maximal medical therapy, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, spironolactone, they got their ICD, they got their body base, and they're failing, but they're not requiring inotropes. So uh, we're back to discussing uh, the, the viability of mechanical support field uh, if we do not test this technology in the less sick people, i.e. patients who are not currently requiring inotropes, or what we call intermax levels four through seven. Nada, what do you think? Well, I mean, I think that the, that is the precise question, is whether uh, we as a field are ready to move this technology into patients who are less sick uh, and be able to uh, achieve even better results. Um, and that is what the uh, core of the REVIVED trial is, uh, to address this particular uh, group of patients. Um, I think that in order to be able to address this particular group of patients, uh, it is certainly the, uh, the weight is on the surgeons that we cannot have any complications and any mortality in this group of patients because as opposed to the inotrope-dependent patients that we already know what the outcome is going to be with mm -hmm. continued medical therapy, this is really in a group of patients who are ambulatory uh, and who have uh, reasonable functional capacity and the indications are really uh, addressing their quality of life. Uh, and as such, the devices need to be good enough to improve their quality of life because we don't necessarily at this stage know whether there's going to be any incremental benefit in survival. Uh, so I think it's a very important question uh, and uh, the REVIVED trial hopefully will address that for us. Uh, so you're assuming that our devices are good enough? That is a difficult question to answer. I think that, that, that uh, as I said, from, from a survival standpoint, I think that patients who are uh, in the category that REVIVED is going to be looking at, which is primarily class 3 patients, non-inotrope dependent patients, who are going to uh, be destination therapy candidates. Uh, so these are not patients that we're going to, at any point, transplant. Uh, the question is going to be whether the benefits uh, of the incremental improvement in quality of life and perhaps some degree of functional capacity outweigh the potential risks of the device. Um, I think with the HeartMate 2 now with, again, about 13,000 worldwide implants, we have a very good understanding of what type of complications we're talking about. And I think 
uh, you know, the stroke rate with this device is low enough uh, that uh, it warrants to be in this trial. Uh, the issues with device infections and driveline infections uh, is something that we will see how it pans out over time. Uh, and GI bleeding, although we talked a lot about it, uh, and it is a problem in about 20 to 30 percent of patients who get these devices, we don't know that this would be the same in the less sick population. Mm -hmm. And I think also that, you know, uh, risk of death in patients with GI bleeding is very, very low. There are very few patients who've died as a result of mm -hmm. uh, GI bleeding. So I think, yes, we are at the point that we can test this, uh, and this is the right time to test it because if we want to wait for the next generation devices to come out before we address this question, we're talking about five to seven years down the line. So if we need to get to an answer, this is the time to do it. Chris, what do you think of the Revive trial? Are you familiar with the you and are you familiar with the logistics of enrollment? Yeah, we're actually going to be in both trials. We're in Roadmap and we're going to be in Revive it. Um, I think it's going to be somewhat challenging to enroll. Um, you know, our center is committed to six patients over two years, and uh, we have a fairly six over two years. Over two years. My understanding is that if you don't enroll within sixty days of the trial beginning, you're probably going to be asked to correct, correct. Move on. So there's be eighteen centers, and if each center commits to, you know, five to six patients, you're going to get to the to the end point. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a couple things that make this hard. The first question really comes down to informed consent. So we're going to be approaching a group of patients that they're going to be uh, asked to uh, accept a device which has complications which they may not otherwise be exposed to. So I think it's going to be very important that uh, the patients who are enrolled in this are patients who really have a, um, a commitment to the trial and, and, and are seeking that better quality of life. And I think the data, even though it's important, is going to be a proof of concept, but it's always going to be a moving target because it, it would be foolish, I think, to assume that the next generation device wouldn't have some improvement. So even if we have, um, uh, and it may be physiologic, it may be in terms of complications, but the data is going to be good for this point in time, but it may not be applicable to the next device. So I think it's, 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 it's a process we're going to have to continually go through uh, uh, as, as each new generation of device uh, comes forward. Um, I think there are patients who clearly want this therapy, and, and, they, and they don't meet the current uh, recommendations. And remember, the, the CMS guidelines came from the rematch trial. Mm -hmm. um, so um, that's not the current state of uh, technology we're at today, and I think it's important to reinvestigate it. And what do you think? No, I agree. Oh, you, think, you think the patients are going to buy into this? You think the, the referring cardiologists are going to buy into this? These people are not so sick, Doc, you know, and uh, they still have to carry those seven pounds of batteries and controllers. Listen, he, he can walk one block, he stops, and then he walks again. I mean, do you think the cardiologists have bought into this idea? I think that's going to be, I think that's institutionally dependent. Mm -hmm. I think ideally the selection of the centers who are participating in trials have a group of forward-thinking cardiologists, and that's why they're just centers that are chosen for these kind of trials. I do think that it is going to be difficult to convince the cardiologist. It may be harder to convince the cardiologist than it is to convince the patient. I think patients recognize that this is a lifelong process of heart failure and they sort of know what the end point is on, on the medical side. The question is whether this, and I think every other patients all tend to be very hopeful that this technology will, will bring them better quality of life and a better um, longevity. The real question I think comes up is that, you know, this will, as Chris pointed out, um, so clearly that this is a, a trial that tests the current generation of devices for this set of patients. And I think the real boom will come actually once we get some information from this, is that when the next generation of partial support devices, small devices that come in, which are now competitive with basically the surgical technique of implanting an AICD and a BIV, when that device comes in and hopefully the price point, again the economics, comes to the point of, you know, Thirty-five, forty, fifty thousand dollars for a device as opposed to what they are now. Then I think you know that'll that'll be the next I think truly test of this concept of whether three B patients because can we make their life better, but can we also pro prevent the progression now to you know stage four and end stage heart failure where transplant is necessary? And then you're talking about literally, as you point out, market that's millions instead of just a hundred thousand. What do you think? I'm, I'm a little bit hopeful that if we implant some less sick patients, we may be able to recover a few more. You know, there may be an opportunity before the ventricle becomes so dilated that recovery is not an option. Recovery is such a nebulous field now. We don't really know 
willing to take the pump out, who's the right patient. But we may be able to identify, you know, as this isn't part of the trial, but this may be a side benefit of doing something. Right, like and, and I think the, and the other thing is that there's, I think that could be then coupled with, you know, the, the advances in, you know, um, stem cell oh, therapy, therapy or correct. gene therapy. Right. And I think so that then we're going to begin to build that into an armamentarium. So we're not just surgeons re-plumbing the, mm. the heart. We're actually doing some other therapeutic right. intervention, which will serve as an adjunct to our surgical intervention. This one, of, one of the problems I have with Revive It is the end point. I mean, the, the, generally, the end point of death is very easy. It's yes or no. When we talk about functional capacity and quality of life, there's three things you can measure. You can throw a questionnaire at them, the best one being the KCCQ, which is a questionnaire. You can do uh, some maximum exercise capacity, which is a six-minute walk, which is an easy test to do. It's an easy to, to cheat on, it's, if you will. It's, it's exertion familiarity. Mm -hmm. And the VO2 max, which is a very difficult trial uh, thing to do to bring patients back to do, to put a bicycle and so forth. So the FDA has always had problems with primary endpoints, at least in VAT therapies, to be a functional study. So that's going to be difficult, um, you know, how to parse that out. And my guess is going to be a combined, eventually it's going to be, you're going to have to have a combined endpoint of death plus Something function change, else. change in, because just purely exertional capacity and questionnaires are not just not robust enough. You brought an excellent point, and you, you spoke about uh, the non-sternotomy devices as a potential. So we talk about partial support here. What are your thoughts about partial support? We have Circulite coming to the shores of the United States probably second quarter this year. Uh, I know uh, Abbeyman has a device they're working on. Uh, what are your thoughts about partial support? Should we investigate it? Is it true? Is it real? Who, what patient should we test it on? And do you think it could be a, a game changer for the field? Right, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, again, uh, because the vast majority of our experience has been in intermax level one, two, and three, with the majority nowadays being in intermax level two and three. The question is if we start looking at er earlier stage patients, uh, in, in the case of Circulite, looking at intermax level four to seven, uh, where uh, we are at this stage maybe at some point uh, reluctant uh, for device therapy. The cardiologists do not refer those patients to device therapy. If we have a device that is easier to implant, does not require sternotomy, but yet doesn't give full hemodynamic support and just gives pulsure support would make sense. Uh, and the Circulite Synergy device really kind of fits into that category. The device is the size of a AA battery. Uh, it's supposed to be implanted in a pacemaker-like pocket, although at this point it requires a uh, mini thoracotomy for insertion of the inflow cannula into the right atrium. Left atrium. The uh, left atrium, I'm sorry. Uh, and the uh, and the outflow graft gets sewn with the graft into the subclavian artery. So that's the that's the exact patient population. And as you know, the trial was completed uh, in Europe, and a CE mark has been given to that device in mm -hmm. Europe, and uh, the results have been spectacular, uh, spectacular. So I think, again, uh, it's another... A uh, paradigm shift in terms of our thinking uh, of uh, when to improve uh, patients' quality of life as opposed to only looking at survival as our surrogate endpoint. Mm -hmm. and, and, and with all the pitfalls that you mentioned in terms of what does improvement in quality of life mean. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly that, that is the current thinking in terms of where we go. And uh, Chris touched on something that, uh, that I think is incredibly important, and that's the fact that if we intervene with mechanical support on these patients earlier in their course. Do we have sufficiently good medical therapy at present without the stem cells and without the other uh, conventional related stuff. conventional? With current conventional medical therapy, can we actually improve uh, uh, on recovery of these patients? And that issue was actually brought up uh, in the circular trial in Europe because they thought that some of these patients actually had significant reverse remodeling mm -hmm. with this partial support device. So again, I think it's very exciting. Um, you know, that's why this field, I think, is going to continue to grow because there are so many interesting unanswered questions. Now that we have pumps that we can have good survival with patients, now we can start addressing some of these other uh, issues. And I agree with you a, a thousand percent. The only thing I would add is that the pump-related complications have to continue to go down. So the healthier and healthier patient you do, yes. there will be less and less tolerance. Oh, absolutely. I, yeah. I totally agree with you. Uh, but again, if you uh, look at the data on the 25 patients who were mm -hmm. uh, in the circular trial in Europe, 
their complication rates is almost negligible. It is so low that it's very acceptable. Now, of course, these are healthier patients, patients, so they don't have RV dysfunction. They don't have, uh, and they didn't even have a lot of uh, infectious complications. So uh, I think that you're absolutely correct that we have to have neg negligible complication rates with these to make it appealing to a class three patient or a advanced class three patient. I think the circular paradigm is, uh, I think is a must. We have to explore it. I think it's potentially a game changer because that I think could have that, you know, take off. Uh, uh, market Absolutely. takes off and Wall Street is happy uh, effect. <laughs> but again, you have peripherals that are the size of HeartMe too. They're big batteries still, they're big controllers. Very not not so very sick patients. Are they going to buy into this? Um, as you know, is adding one liter a minute sufficient? Well, one and a half liters a minute. I think it is, but uh, you know, the data, data waits. Um, I, and, and the other issue is, is if the pump fails, yes. you still have an alive patient. And you go in and you change sure. it much like you do a pacemaker generator. Yes. Cut the incision, you cut the graft, and you suture. So that, from that standpoint, it's uh, sort of uh, an attractive therapy as well. There, there are definitely patients that um, have such significant limitation in their quality of life that they're seeking an alternative to feel better. Mm -hmm. and, and I have had patients like that multiple times where they come and they understand that getting the LVAD is not necessarily for a survival advantage, but the fact that it'll improve their quality of life, that they can actually get out of the house, they can do some of the things that they were doing several years earlier. So I think these technologies are fantastic, but the patient needs to understand what the limitations of the technology are and, and, and it has to be a fit with the patient. And I think, you know, and, and the other thing, too, is, you know, I tell them, you know, what are the various rates of complications we see for various events. So how, how spe that's a good, good point you're making. How specific are you? Because some of our patients don't have the intellectual capacity to grasp all so, this. So, so what do you do? So I summarize in the end by saying this, is that the reality is that you, frankly, don't, you, the patient, his family, don't really care what the outcomes are for the last 100 patients I've done thing you really care about, what happens to you? I said, so the reality is for you, the complication rates are either zero, it oh. doesn't happen, or it's 100%. And you have to accept the fact that if it happens to you, that's 100% occurrence, which means that you have to be fully cognizant that if you had a stroke, that's going to be real. If you had a GI bleed, that's going to be real. If you end up with a trach, it's... Been, and those are things that you, you have to, I think, impress upon them. The, the numbers for some of these complications are relatively low, but I think you have to make them understand that it can and does happen, and they have to be willing to accept that if it happens to them, that's what they're going to be living mm -hmm. with. And I think that sort of I think summarizes pretty well because you know the numbers vary from institution, and you can quote studies, and you know you can go back to each of the studies. And, tell, and you're right, a lot of patients don't have the wherewithal to sort of comprehend exactly what that actually means. But I think if you summarize it to a point, let them recognize: Are they going to be able to cope with specific complications were it to occur to them? I think most of them can sort of get a pretty good grasp about exactly what they're getting themselves into. We bring a good point. I want to ask the three of you this question. How, do you empower your patients to make the decision what you have to you know, We all have, I believe all four of us have both approved devices in our pockets, in our shelves. Do you make that decision for them? Do you let, let them make the decision for you? How, how do you play that, that situation? It uh, depends on the patients. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some patients who have uh, actually read a lot about the devices and they actually specifically request one device over the other. Okay. Uh, the other patients you need to really sit down uh, and discuss the two devices with them. Uh, in this case we're talking about the hardware HVAD and the mm -hmm. HeartMate 2 LVAD. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in both of these, in those cases generally what we do is we show them both of the devices mm -hmm. uh, and then <clears throat> both the nurse practitioners as well as myself we just briefly go over the pros and cons of one device versus the other uh, and allow the patient to choose. Now there are certain patients that I think uh, in my mind uh, may have a relative contraindication for one pump versus the other. For example, for example, well for example as someone who has a history of GI bleeding and we know that they are more prone to developing GI bleeding at some point during their LVAD support, my personal preference would be to put in a heart to LVAD in them. Uh, the reason for that is because I believe that uh, in cases where if a GI bleed were to occur, uh, I would feel more comfortable stopping anticoagulation with a HeartMate 2 device than I would be with a uh, HVAD device. On the other 
on the other side of that uh, coin, you can claim, at least there's some data to suggest, the hardware device has a lesser incentive of GI bleed to begin with. So, you know, you can say, well, we should put a hardware in that device because it's less likely to get a GI bleeding anyway. Most of the heart made, most of the GI bleed aid in the literature is in heart made 2 patients. Yes. Again, I, I think you need to believe in that data. Mm -hmm. that GI bleeding is less uh, depending on the uh, pump type. Mm -hmm. um, I, I believe that we haven't reached that threshold yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I know that, for example, with the Dura heart pump, uh, which uh, did not complete this trial, there was some suggestion that GI bleeding was less with that device, but in actuality, when you look at the data, it's still around 10 to 12 percent, and in all trials, it's been around 10 to 12 percent for most devices, although single centers are, are reporting much higher rate of GI bleeding with these devices. I remember the, the, the trial <coughs> publications are six month or one year follow-up, and we've seen a lot of those after. Chris, do you empower the patient? How do you do this? When you go to a patient and you say, I'm going to put a uh, an aortic valve, you don't show them all the aortic valves, you just decide which is best for them, what you think is best. Uh, so I, I, same paradigm? Our, our approach is very similar to Nader's with a few caveats. We, uh, we do do shared care. So we have patients who are quite very far away. So if their long-term cardiologist is going to be able to take care of them, they have to be able to take care of the device. So that's one factor. I agree with Nader. There are some situations when, based on body habits, comorbid disease, one device may be better suited for an individual. We don't give the patient the choice. Give and, me an example says, of that. I actually think small patients, small yeah, so uh, small small size patients. Army two uh, elbow might correct. Pain, so you put a heart with a chest ball or yeah. um, uh, assuming that they're candidates for both devices uh, and assuming they have insurance coverage for both, um, we offer the patients uh, the opportunity to hold the peripherals, touch the device, and make a choice. Um, we still have equipoise that the devices uh, have similar rates of complication um, and uh, of success. Um, obviously, that's a moving target, but that's that's our current approach. And I think um, Nader's right. A lot of the patients come in with an extensive knowledge, and if you just if they just looked at the size of the pumps alone, human nature is to choose the smaller pump. Yep. Um, but it's important to you know to give them the information they that they need to make that the best choice. Yeah, I've had patients come. I want the Cheney's pump. Yeah, I've had I've had that happen. I don't know if you guys have had that. And that was you know eight out of ten will say the smaller uh, the, the knee jerk reaction is the smaller pump. Yeah, it's you got to educate them. Smaller is not better necessarily. Yeah, and then there'll be soon there'll be additional uh, trials in the U.S. So there some centers will participate in the Jarva trial, or the HeartMate three is probably not too far away, and there's going to be a whole new set of issues to, to contend with. And where's my drive line going to be? You know, how much anticoagulation do I have to take? I think uh, if we're going to have less sick patients, they are probably people who are more apt to make informed decisions. They're going to want to be part of the process. I think we're we're very similar. I mean, the patient has a degree of um, I think large degree of participation in deciding device. And unfortunately, sometimes it really is dictated by the insurance more than it is by any of us, mm -hmm. what device is covered by the private insurers and, and so on and so forth. But I think that, you know, it, the really um, key thing is that I think we also have to have a, some active role in guiding them at some point, because I think there are specific considerations, such as what Nader and Chris have already addressed, that we have to let the patient understand that those things should also weigh into the selection. Because you're right, there's a simple market appeal of just having a nice small device, the newer device, and so forth. But you know, it is. Smaller doesn't mean better, newer doesn't mean better. That's why we have clinical trials going and trying to you know, gather more clinical experience. And that's sort of the things that we have to, I think, instill in our patient. I think there's a lot of things we don't know. I think I was talking to another surgeon, and there are, I think, some issues as far, you know, they they choose their device based on, for example, the extent of pulmonary hypertension that the patients have. And so it is their, in their own personal database, and they have a fairly large database, that patients who have higher pulmonary you know, artery pressure grade in 60 gets the heart mate too. So there are some considerations, and I think they'll be presenting that data at ICHLT this year. So, I mean, we're, there's so much to learn, and as we're learning, we sort of then have to sort of parlay our newfound knowledge to, you know, our guidance to the patient. And so, again, you know, as everybody has eloquently said, this is kind of a, a moving field, and as we gain more knowledge, then the patient also then gain access to our expertise.
You know, there's, there's two things you said that made me just, the first thing is the question of equipoise, because all, so much of this is institution specific. So one institution may have great results with one pump and horrible results with the other pump. So I'm not so sure that most of the data that's been published are relatively small series. I'm not so sure that applies to everybody. You know, your own experience is Absolutely. important. Sure. And I think you, you, the other thing is we have to stay open-minded about paradigm changes, because if we don't, we might miss out on the opportunity to, to really move the field forward. Well, let me close by asking each one of you to tell us where we're going to be 10 years from now on the field. Hopefully some of us will be retired, <laughs> but where is the field going to be 10 years from now? Nader? Well, uh, um, I think that uh, the newer generation of pumps that are currently in development, we're all uh, going to be uh, on our shelves. So uh, devices that are uh, fully magnetically levitated or some combination with magnetic levitation, um, so I think that there are going to be a lot of improvements in pump technology. I think we're going to move more towards uh, centrifugal pumps. Uh, I think are we going pumps, to be fully implantable I think 10 that, years from now? I think 10 years from now we will have fully implantable pumps uh, with hopefully better battery life. And I also think it's a potential that we'll move towards uh, exploring uh, minimally invasive ways of putting these pumps in, hopefully in earlier stage patients as well. Chris, do you disagree? Any no, I, I agree. I think uh, we're going to be fully implantable. Um, uh, I don't know if centrifugal or axial is going to win out, but I think uh, fully implantable. I think we'll do less sick patients. Uh, right now we do more pumps than we do transplants. If I had to guess, we'd probably be doing 20,000 implants a year in the U.S. Um, and I think that uh, there's going to be um, a push for this field to grow beyond the cardiac surgeon world into the cardiology world. Um, so I think we're going to see uh, uh, more practitioners willing to put devices in as they get simpler to put in. I, mean, I think the uh, the saying says, you know, I'm not very good about predicting the future, or predicting anything, especially the future. The future, Joe Bear. And this is this is exactly one of those situations. But I do think that there's going to be a lot of, I think, great new technology that's being incorporated into our field. I mean, I, I certainly can imagine that at some point we'll end up with some kind of a, a, a adorable device that can be implanted entirely you know, intravascularly, just like what Tavi is doing. We'll probably have a motor that can be mounted on a device that you'll be able to stent across the valve and just leave it in place. And then we just have, you know, and so the, the, I think the, the, the technology is, is sort of unending and large part is sort of being able to, I think, rein in the cost of our development and rein in the cost of the product. Because there, there's no question in my mind that given the current um, healthcare state and 10 years from now where we're going to be, there is already a process of rationing of health care, except the rationing is not done by the government, it's done by the health care providers and the insurance provider and so forth. And, and as I said earlier, I think the ability for us to provide it, the perfect technology and an astronomical cost is gone. I think the paradigm of how we work has to change. And I always think about like the iPhones, everybody has the iPhone 5. And if you take a look at iPhone 5 versus 4S versus 4 versus 3, and you look at the scale of technological improvement in each of these, and granted, it's just a phone, but it's still remarkable. But you know, the cost for manufacturing the iPhone 5 is exactly $1 more than what it costs to manufacture the iPhone 4S. And they sell it contract-wise at exactly the same cost. And But you know, they're able to get away with it because the technology improves, performance gets better, the people get better product at the same price or lower price, and the volume goes up. And in some sense, I mean, we almost sort of have to change our, our way of thinking of how we get to that point of, you know, optimal patient care. It's optimal patient care, but delivered affordably for the whole country. So we do have a perfect device. It's the iPhone 5. <laughs> <laughs> so we uh, close this. Thank you very much. Thank you.